In this final section of the introduction to Linux, we will look at file editors, in particular those which allow easy editing of files within a terminal environment. Gaining familiarity with a terminal-based text editor is an important step to making you more productive when working on a remote server. We will look at pipelines, which allow you to seamlessly redirect flow of data from one application to another. Then we will cover compression and archive formats. And finally, we will explore management of processes. There are many different file editors available on Linux. Most of them are command line based, for example Nano, Vim and Emacs. However, there are graphical editors available such as Gedit and Xemacs to provide a Windows-like experience. This tutorial focuses on the Nano editor, which is either installed by default or available off the shelf on most Linux distributions. The example here demonstrates how to open either a new or existing file using Nano ready for editing. Some core program functions or shortcuts include saving a file with Ctrl and O and exiting Nano with Ctrl and X. If the file has been modified but not yet saved when you press Ctrl and X, Nano will prompt if you would like to save the file similar to how editors function on Windows. The common shortcuts are printed at the bottom when editing files in Nano. The caret symbol that you see here represents the control key. Let's create a new file using Nano on the terminal. So let's open a new file, let's call it drinks. And what I'm going to do here is add a few items to the list. So let's add water, juice, cola and coffee. Now the list is complete, I'm going to press Ctrl and X to exit, click Y to save, press Enter to confirm the file name, and now the file is written. And now I'm going to run the cat command to display the contents of this new file. A very powerful feature of Linux is the ability to chain commands together as part of a pipeline rather than executing each one separately with some intermediate result. To start a pipeline of commands, first enter a command which will generate output that can be understood by another command as input. Then add the pipe character, otherwise known as a vertical bar, before the start of the next command. There is no limit to the number of commands you can use in a pipeline, however, it is recommended to test each part of the pipeline individually to ensure the output is as expected. In the first example here, we are printing the contents of the fruit file with cat and using another utility tool to sort the results alphanumerically. In the second example, we are passing the contents of the fruit file to the word count program, asking it to return the number of lines in the file, which in this case is 5. Let's run a few example pipelines using the drinks file we created in the nano tutorial using the terminal. Firstly, let's print the contents of the drinks file with cat. Then, let's display the results alphanumerically using the sort command. We can also include grep in the pipeline. Now let's count the lines which match the grep pattern of words beginning with the letter C in the drinks file. Gzip is an open source data compression program that allows you to reduce the size of a file using a compression algorithm. You may commonly see large files stored on the web, for example genome files, in a zipped format to reduce disk space and file download times. In the first example here, we are compressing the fruits file. After compression, the file extension changes to a .gz format, and you can no longer view the plain text file using cat, less, or a text editor. There are other utility programs which will allow you to view the contents of a compressed file without first needing to uncompress it, such as zcat and zless. You may also use said grep 
to search for strings or regular expressions within compressed files. In the second example here, we are displaying the contents of the compressed fruit file using Zcat. To uncompress a file that has originally been compressed with gzip, use either the dash "-d", parameter to the gzip command, or the gunzip command, which will run the former for you. Let's run a few compression examples on the terminal. Using the drinks file created in the nano tutorial, I have added a few more entries to the file to demonstrate the effect of compression, even on small files. By running the ls and word count programs, we can see the file is 300 bytes in size and contains 50 lines. Running gzip on this file significantly reduces the file size by over 5 times. The .gz extension gets added to the file to represent the file is now compressed and if you have terminal colours enabled you'll see the file coloured in red. Now by using zgrep, pipelines, sort and a new command called unique which will merge duplicates on adjacent lines we can search for unique drinks which begin with the letter C in our newly compressed file without needing to uncompress it first. Finally. To uncompress the file, run g unzip to return the file back to its original state, which we confirm here by running ls. The tar command is used to archive a collection of files and directories into a single file, commonly called a tar or tarball. Originally, the command was used for file system backups to tape, However, now it is also used for software distribution and the transfer of data between computer systems. TAR may be combined with a compression program, such as gzip, to create compressed archives. As archiving and compression go hand in hand, you may archive and compress in one operation using the TAR command with additional switches, for example dash "-z", for gzip, and dash "-j", for bzip. In the first example here, we are creating an uncompressed archive of the shopping list directory. It is important to note that the dash "-f", parameter on the tar command requires the name of the archive as an argument before any of the switches. Therefore, the ordering of switches matters in this case. The dash "-v", parameter prints the list of files and directories processed into the archive and may be optionally omitted. The second example creates a compressed archive of the shopping list directory using gzip. Finally, we are extracting the files from the compressed archive using the same algorithm used to compress. If you attempt to uncompress with a different algorithm, you will be displayed with an error message. Let's run a few examples on the terminal. Let's firstly create an archive of the examples directory using gzip compression to a new tarball called myfiles.tar.gz. This file can now be copied around the file system or to a different machine without affecting the original files. Now let's extract the contents of myfiles.tar.gz to the system's temporary directory. You may either change to the desired directory to extract to as shown or use tars capital C parameter to extract to an alternative location to the current working directory. A process is an instance of a program or command that is being executed. Each process will receive a unique system-wide process identifier and a local terminal process identifier. There are two methods to start processes. The most common is in the foreground, meaning the process must finish before the prompt is redisplayed. All the commands and examples you have seen so far have been run in the foreground, which is the default behavior. In the first example, we are running the sleep command in the foreground for one minute. The terminal will wait until the command is finished before allowing you to enter another command. Background processes will continue to run on the system whilst returning the prompt back to the user, which enables multitasking. 
To start a process in the background, add the ampersand character to the end of the command. The terminal will confirm the system and local process identifiers after starting the process in the background. In the second example, we start the sleep process in the background. The terminal will execute this on the system and redisplay the prompt, ready for another command. To display a list of processes running in the background, run the jobs command. Processes started in the foreground may be stopped or terminated by sending the interrupt signal, control C. If a process catches this signal, it will stop the process immediately and the prompt will be redisplayed. Processes running in the background must be killed by either the system or terminal process identifier. To avoid a conflict of process ID numbers, local processes must be prepended with the percent sign, otherwise the system would interpret this as a system identifier. You may also kill processes by name using the pkill command. Here we are terminating all processes named sleep. A user may only kill processes owned by themselves to ensure the integrity of a multi-user system. To view a list of running processes, you can use the top, or PS, which is short for process table snapshot, commands. Top will indefinitely display a snapshot of the process table until exited with either the Q key or control C. Here is an example of using each command to display a list of processes that you own. If we did not pass the dash u parameter to top, a full list of processes owned by all users will be displayed. We recommend reading the top man page for how to filter processes whilst using the program. Finally, the $user argument is a shell built-in environment variable which will reference the username of the currently logged in user.